by some people's accounts, the most distinguished anthropologist and the most distinguished uh, sociologist in the world. So that is the beginning and end of my introduction. Okay. It's downhill from there. Okay, would you like me to begin? Yes, Okay. There appears to be a feverish preoccupation these days with archives and memory often seen as a product of a post-Cold War zeitgeist, of a popular distaste for authoritarian government, and a scholarly critique of monolithic master narratives and the archival science in place that authorizes them. This is a moment marked by the widespread production of counter-chronicles of the past, not only in post-colonial polities, but also in nation states increasingly regaled by assertions of difference, hyphenation, heterodoxy. A corollary of these counter chronicles is an exhilarating, expansive sense of what might count as an archive. And with it goes a readiness to accord value to popular rec recollections in the crusade to recover forms of consciousness allegedly long suppressed. Many have taken the post Cold War epoch to be an age of healing, a repair of the violent rupture between history and memory that, if we follow Renan, gave birth to modern narratives of nationhood. The sense of emancipation, of recall, of rapprochement, vide the memory movements in Latin America, Spain, Lebanon, on and on, has lent growing legitimation to the power of memory as a deus ex machina, a vehicle that speaks truth from beyond the logos of the law or the arc of the annals, at least as conventionally understood. In some quarters, in fact, the very ideas of archive and memory have been profoundly unsettled. A recuperation, perhaps, of Nietzsche's sense of the usefulness of the unhistorical, of the plastic power of peoples to dissolve the past and the strange into the present and the familiar, thus to forget what they cannot subdue. In Derrida's powerful reimagining, the archive is less a neutral site of retention than a mechanism for maintaining one memory at the expense of another, for simultaneously curating and bearing truth, in short, as a public prosthetic extension of memory itself. Yet the burgeoning preoccupation with memory has also nurtured critical tendencies of a somewhat different, even antithetical sort. I have in mind here the conception of combative recall captured by South African poet Don Matera in his 1987 book, Memory as Weapon. Or similarly, the trope of nostalgia as developed, developed by his countryman, Jacob Glamini, in his work, Native Nostalgia a nostalgia of the senses that bears within it a legacy of unalienated existence, affect, longing, that lies beneath the facile, more facile formulations, including those that never dramatize the past. To be sure, this orientation has a long genealogy in the modern world, although its immediate referent in these instances is less the Shoah than apartheid, and the colonial atrocities of which it's become the prime index. Although it has spawned many excessive, expressive genres, marked and unmarked, elevated and ordinary, the injunction to recollect is most prosaically captured by a panoply of procedures glossed as democratization, the paraphernalia of transitional justice, truth commissions, the recognition of victims, the granting of amnesty. Key to such projects of political and moral reconstruction is the idea of collective remembrance and recognition a process that turns on the elixir of memory itself, a kind of protean catch-all, memory as metaphor and metonym, as psychological and social, as inside and outside culture and history, as sub and supremely conscious. Memory as a modality that after Mary Warnock is held to transcend the mind-body split. Memory also in the spirit of Yosef Yerushalmi or Desmond Tutu holds the secret of redemption drawing on a kind of guileless candor of lived experience, of somatic substance of the poetics of ritual. It seems then that notwithstanding the caution of the likes of Halbrachs, who insisted that, for all its usefulness in challenging dominant narratives, memory is in itself neither primitive nor sacred, much of the late modern memory boom has configured us in just such self solvific terms. Certainly in a world in which imaginings of collective futures are thoroughly unsettled, we seem ever more imbued with an obligation to remember, 
to ground forward aspirations in modes of legitimation, heritage, injury, dispossession, that reach backwards in time, less to make evident histories of ongoing struggle than to secure a present purged of tension, even politics. Techniques of recollection, recollection, both organized and diffuse, public and private, proliferate on all sides. Today, contra nature, communal, communal healing requires recovering buried memories, disinterring broken bones, laboriously recount, recounting the past, the pain of atrocities past. Social reconstruction, post-conflict, post-revolution, post-totalitarian, often invests itself primarily in such pageants of recall, confessions of abuse, <coughs> dramas of apology and forgiveness. <coughs> what is more, recollection is not simply a means of venting trauma so as to lay the past to rest. Popular aid memoir, archives, museums, monuments, murals, installations, increasingly theme parks, are designated to put the, comment, the command that thou shalt not forget to remember. <laughs> Yet while the rationale of the memory industry is to transcend trauma, to pre preclude, preclude repetition in the spirit of never again, it seems more preoccupied actually with the opposite, the effort to anchor identity in particular iterative leg legacies of suffering, i.e. in heritage. It is instructive here to note, after Rossington and Whitehead, that memory, holocaust, and heritage were added to the 2005 update of Raymond Williams' keywords. As the Stroika suggests, heritage, the past as property, is closely tied to claims for recognition based on distinctive legacies of victimhood. Could it be then that amidst all this memorialization, we are becoming profoundly unhistorical, if perhaps not quite in the sense that Nietzsche intended? That the productive opening to confront histories of the long durée, an opening afforded by the unsettling of history, archive, and memory, has too quickly been closed by the easy embrace of memory. This is an antidote to the nervousness that is felt in many quarters about grand historical generalizations in these late liberal times. The question is especially acute in those societies that have undergone marked transitions from illiberal pasts. There's a lot more in the longer version of this that talks about Eastern Europe and so on. But in South Africa, for instance, an infatuation, almost an obsession with memory, goes along with the desire, most notably among the so-called born free generation, to seize the present as post-political and post-ideological, thus to rid themselves of the burden of the past. This is often expressed as such. Now it goes without saying that collective <coughs> efforts to transcend the past do not amount to an end to history. History no more disappears with forgetting than does an ostrich with its head in the sand, unless of course history is taken to be nothing more than historical consciousness oblivious of its own social, cultural, and material embedding in the world. But I would argue that at least for places like South Africa, that the present is being rendered unhistorical in significant respects. This less by way of forgetting than by dint of an excess of memory of a particular particularizing kind. The kind that makes it hard to recover the terms even for confronting the inequities and uproars that are left unaddressed by rituals of reconciliation tensions that remain all too legible in the fractured outlines of the present. If for Nietzsche what impended argument of this latter kind was the, a pathological view of history as a rational science, the sense that that's what it was, nowadays the threat is often of the opposite, a kind of celebration of the past as a privatized and, parti as a privatized and particularized, as a species of recollection that lays partisan claim to genealogies, identities, citizenship, reparation. In South Africa, the rite de passage of traditional justice that turned an agonistic racial state into a rainbow nation turns on a process of collective expiation in which memory becomes the common medium of humanization and commensuration. <coughs> Purified by pain, such recollection is rendered as an act of witnessing, of giving testimony in the court of public assessment, a process of history making framed both figuratively and pragmatically in the terms of legal adjudication. Or perhaps as a kind of legal theology, as was mentioned yesterday, but not a comfortable secularized uh, theology at that, because things like the amnesty hearings um, that, took, that were part of uh, the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa took the form of confessionals, 
know, as a, as a kind of process that very explicitly laid the Christological on top of the jurisprudential. We talked a bit about this yesterday. Indeed, whatever might be happening to history here, it increasingly becomes caught up in a juridification of the past, a process in which the rights and wrongs of historical acts and facts and the claims arising out of them are subject to determination either by legal procedures or by their simulacra. Now, of course, quasi-judicial investigations into atrocities past are hardly new. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace inquired into crimes against civilians during the Balkan Wars. But as Grandin and Klubach underline in a recent piece, more recent truth commissions have their origins primarily in Latin America's so-called transition to democracy. Their political salience is not so much to lay the foundations for constitutional rule as to, and I quote, index the shift from the global crises of the 1970s to the post-Cold War Pax neoliberal. Not vested with legal authority to, to indict and, and prosecute, at least for the most part, these procedures have been less concerned to confront the violence and iniquities of the past than to deploy the law after Durkheim as a means of realizing social solidarity through consensus, tolerance, and forgiveness. The inbuilt limitation, this inbuilt limitation, has meant that mechanisms of transitional justice have quickly exhausted their capacity to consolidate institutions of liberal jurisprudence in the face of continuing structural instability. Yet truth and reconciliation commissions remain implicated in the ongoing late liberal present in complicated ways, and they've structured the whole politics of everyday interaction in many ways one could go into the everyday ethnography of their effects. Uh, in many places too, like South Africa, Canada, and Colombia, they've been explicitly hailed as forums for rewriting national history, yeah, thus to replace discredited narratives with a new kind of multivocal chronicle based on the very fullness of collective recollection. But what are the consequences of coupling law and history. Where, uh, wherein lie the implications of arriving at histories of the continuous present by way of legal processes in which time and event, memory and evidence, agency and motivation are defined in terms of transitional justice, ostensibly also post-conflict. Now, it has often been noticed, uh, noted the promise of, of the law to set, right to, to set wrongs to rights underpinned the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission with its unique blend of the dural, the memorial, the ritual, the therapeutic. While the TRC was not censo stricto, a court of law, it went to considerable lengths, as people like Richard Wilson have noted, uh, to mimic the law, opting for a legal positivist rather than a sociological historical modus operandi. There were truth commissions that employed historians uh, to, to engage in forms of kind of structural uh, assessment, but this was not the case with this one. Its procedures were designed above all to translate diverse testimonial practices into concrete, verifiable evidence, that is, into data of a very particular sort. The TRC at RC has been censured for the limited scope of its investigative mandate. The commission focused explicitly on individual acts of torture, merger, murder, rape, um, and, and uh, graphic evidence of bodily violation and on the retrieval of the intentions of perpetrators conceived in terms of rather narrowly defined political objectives. For some critics, the fact that its M amnesty committee granted immunity only to those behaving out of loyalty to political or military organizations, be it those of the state or those of liberation movements, reveals a belief that the usual narratives of history the struggle by institutions for power, could induce people to do otherwise unacceptable things. This in turn implies a faith that the truth-finding process might disentangle named persons from the institutions that corrupted them, so that, in the words of the TRC report, they could become human again, members of a normalized society. The reclamation of their humanity, though, required full disclosure of relevant facts. And while there was no absence of debate about the nature of truth, method, or objectivity within the orbit of the commission, its deliberations presumed, at least as a kind of workable veracity, that those facts could be laid bare in their completeness. This by way of the rigorous use of law-like procedures and the revelatory force of memories of pain and suffering. 
taken for granted here are conventions that permit the possibility of drawing clean distinctions between truth and deception, sincerity and, cyn and, and cynicism, the occurrence and the acts of witnessing. Like other endeavors of the same sort, the TRC assumed a mimetic relation between memory and event. Even more, it attributed a unique revelatory power to rec recollection fueled by trauma. By memory so charged that, as veteran struggle journalist Hugh, and, Hugh Lewin put it, it needed neither interpretation nor explanation. <coughs> Here in Prospect was a means of separating the human subject from the ravages of history. Out of the unfolding open-endedness of anguished recall, wrote historian David Teeler, witnesses struggled with the deepest recesses of their individuality and humanity, with the fluid human wildness they had experienced." Unquote. Regrettably, he concluded, the commission, like many scholars and critics of its procedures, sought them to tame this flow by imposing upon it restrictions of narrative structure. For Taylor, in short, the act of recollection at its most passionate, spontaneous, and redemptive is like, and is like, unlike other forms of communication. It eludes what are semantic and political distortions. And uh, here I just want to draw the parallel to many other places in social theory making right now, where there's this quest to get beyond mediation, beyond semiosis, into affect, into revelation, into forms that will bring the deus ex machina uh, into the present to redeem it. But memory everywhere is put into words according to particular genres of speech and self-presentation. Genres passed by received ideas of occasion, personal status, gender, age, race, culture, whatever. Indeed, the evidence makes plain that the public enactment of recall to, um, in the TRC was a complex multimediated performance involving witness selection, briefing, coaching, the shaping of testimony according to stylized protocols. What is more, the salience of distinct cultural conventions was overtly employed in calling upon people to come forward and tell their stories, for instance, the commission cast storytelling as a long-standing, unalienated African tradition. Shades here of what we talked about yesterday with Guy from Spivak about these long durée, the, the long forms of the long durée that come back. In all this, the rationalization of memory, its reduction to conventionalized narrative, was not merely <coughs> inevitable. It was integral to the efforts of victims of apartheid to make their suffering the basis of claims for recognition. Their, rec their recollections were rendered into texts that circulated beyond the context of their utterance as a kind of species of political tender. They became more or less standardized objects that, like legal facts, could be judged, their truth value, <coughs> value consecrated, and their culpability disclosed as kind of public and private goods. And this goes together with all kinds of forms that actually tabulated, tabulating uh, um, reparations, forms of recognition based on categories of, of, of suffering and so on. It is this currency, the coin of memory, that was supposed to fuel the process of reconciliation, animating the triangulation of truth, humanity, and forgiveness. Many observers have remarked that in South Africa and beyond, the link between truth and reconciliation is taken to be self-evident. It is only on the basis of truth that true reconciliation can take place, wrote Desmond Tutu in the introduction to the TRC. And there's a kind of telling rhetoric of repetition here. Public rights of recall were also understood as ab reactions <coughs> in the psychoanalytic sense. The acts of collective catharsis <coughs> that by remembering experience purged it of its malignant excess. At work is an ideal of a, a kind of truth that is beyond manipulation itself a modernist conceit, to be sure. Truth exists, writes George Brock. It's only falsehood that has to be invented. Mm -hmm. As all this underlines, the alchemy of reconciliation rests on a recuperation of the human subject as a remembering self, her humanity made authentic through suffering. Ian Hacking has observed that we are heirs to an Aristotelian tradition in which, and I quote him, personal identity is constituted by memory and any type of amnesia results in something stolen from the self. The remembering self, then, is a would-be metonym of the demos restored. Yet the record makes plain that many survivors did not have their half-remembered, uncertain grasp of the past clarified, recorded, 
or legitimated by the TRC. Their experience didn't conform to the conventions, the narrative biographies of agency, intent, and closure that, uh, that the TRC developed. Indeed, much has been made of the haphazard methods deployed by the Commission for recovering truth, assessing testimony, evaluating authenticity. The readiness at times to induce recall by way of what seems to be almost pornographies of trauma, and I don't know if any of you have seen movies like Long Night's Journey in Today, these kinds of performances underline, I think, Foucault's insistence that knowledge is seldom produced without cruelty. It may well be that ambiguities of this sort are inherent in processes of truth and reconciliation. Being an essential element of the poetics that give ritual everywhere the power to infuse social norms with ineffable fervor, to be Durkheimian for a moment. Uh, but it is precisely here that the authority of the law came into its own, when I think of what was said yesterday. Perhaps because its patchwork of procedure, procedures was so fraught with uncertainty, so lacking in clear forensic standards of practice, the TRC relied heavily on the language of dual facticity to give it the imprimatur of disciplinary rigor a method and arriving at grounded truth as a yardstick by which to measure contrition amidst conflicting understandings and unsettling emotions. Despite its judicial trappings, as I've said, the legal status of the commission and its findings were to prove questionable in the longer run. The standing of its evidence in respect of subsequent court proceedings against those denied amnesty, for example, has been contested. But then, as has often been noted, the truth and reconciliation was a commission from the start, was a product of political compromise, deemed necessary to secure a relatively peaceful transition from the old regime to the new, above all to grant amnesty, to steer clear of histories of structural violence, and also clear of meaningful processes of redistribution. Mm. As an organ of state, the TRC endorsed the view of history as the stuff of individual intention, action, and accountability, of justice as a calculus of human rights, of citizenship as vested in the recognition of injury, entitlement, indemnity. It also validated a sense of political subjectivity rooted in memories of suffering. This has expressed itself in other judicial forums as well, particularly those in which the civil law has been deployed in class action suits to establish injury and liability for past harms. V-Day, the case filed in the U.S. on behalf of victims of apartheid against businesses that allegedly colluded with the old nationalist regi regime. In this, the South African story is one instance of the global movement for indigenous rights and the rights of victims, a movement that has been greatly abetted by the expanding reach of international law. Well, are we in danger of being rendered unhistorical by dint of an excess of partisan recollection? Are we being seduced by the romance of memory that at once authenticated and purified by pain is invested with the capacity to speak truth to power, to make claims for recognition, rights, recompense, healing? And what of the fate of history in the upper case, widely discrediting in just these contexts as capable of positing plausible renderings of the conditions of social being in a continuous present? The production of an archive or its reduction to the service of victims' rights poses a problem for critical historians and political activists everywhere. <coughs> Above all, for those who have long dreamed that decolonization would involve a collective reclamation of the past, both as a record of the demos restored, but also a pliant vehicle for self-writing, to use our shared phrase. On one hand, we've witnessed the welcome repossession of the past by colonial populations. It's hard not to feel an empathy for the kind of homesickness of which Derrida speaks, the nostalgia for an impossible return that is strongly <coughs> marked uh, in the heirs to trauma, but that increasingly colors much more widespread politics of identity and interest. Yet it is also unnervingly evident that in the service of ever more ubiquitous identity struggles, memory can still the flux and indeterminacy of the past. Yeah. It can also still the systemic inequity and violence that has structured both the past and the present. This conundrum presents itself as a theoretical problem as well, of course. Modernist critics from Wordsworth to Benjamin had long believed memory to have unique powers to subvert authority and convention. 
Like the illusion of pre-mediated existence, or the power of revelation, or the force of affect that eludes the imprint of the law. Set against history as hegemony, this view celebrates memory as a vestige of innate inalienable humanity, never truly separable from the imagination and the life of Imogen, from dreaming, affect, or the <coughs> embodied mind. It promises escape from a politics of interest. It comes and goes ostensibly unbidden, representing us with traces of what we've been made to forget. In the spirit of Benjamin, memory was the spark, the flash that enabled the fleeting recognition of truth suppressed by historicism's picture of history. Appealing though this is, we should be wary, I think, of falling prey to memory's weak messianic power, to the sense of a sublime force from elsewhere, uniquely capable of cutting the present to the quick. Even at its most fleeting, memory is as time-bound, time plastic, and interest-bearing as any other socio-cultural phenomenon, especially when bearing the imprimatur of the law or in the service of memory ink. On the other hand, if it's to live up to something of its subversive pre pre uh, promise, if memory is to give creative voice to an unruly imagination, or to frame emerging dissent, or to provide a transient foothold for imminent critique, and it may be that it can still do all these things, it must surely be reunited in a dialectic with history. History is an account of our ongoing agonistic collective production of the present. <laughs> The theme and my question <clears throat> is a puzzle. I, I, I heard your paper as pure Nietzsche, right? That there are three features of memory, uh, the antiquarian, the memorial, the critical, rational, and you were saying we need more critical, rational. What it leaves or what it opens up is the problem of trauma. Uh, trauma cannot be, I want to say, um, missed out. So if we think of Susan Bryson on trauma, uh, then we think that there has to be storytelling, there has to be reconnecting to the community, and that therefore there's a particular, now Now there is a counter example here, right, uh, which is Rwanda. Uh, um, Philip Gravich's new book uh, is going to be about the refusal of memory in Rwanda as a mechanism of survival. My question is between the, let's call it the, because you know, the, the uh, Rwandans say, I will, I recognize that you remember that I remember what we remember and we're not going to talk about it. And that that's a courtesy in that world. Which way do we go on trauma since it seems the most urgent version. Uh, I'm not sure if this is working. Um, if I gave you the sense that I'm discounting the significance of trauma, maybe it's because its centrality in the whole story of truth and reconciliation. Look, what well, truth and reconciliation a la South Africa, which was indeed a recension of this Latin American version, that mob, was a move away from the idea of the proposed Spanish Civil War. Suppress, don't speak, deflect, talk in other ways. Like we forget, <coughs> we forget. Wait, 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 wait. South Africa marked, uh, in a way, that Argentina, the, the reverse. Yep. And, and in fact, the reverse was, in a sense, a, a move from, from silence to trauma, in a sense that I think was far too simplistic mm -hmm. and unnuanced. Right? Trauma is there, indeed, in all of us. These were horrifying events, but they were not only psychoanalytic events. Uh, the, 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 the context of particular trauma was, was specifically uh, validated by a mode of truth-telling here that specifically isolated individual and personal experience, <coughs> the personal violation, the idea of the personal trauma, the interpersonal hurt, from what were the structural conditions thereof. Mm. And my concern is how you move from the idea of trauma A yeah. to something that relocates it into a more ongoing, long durée of the kinds of inequalities yeah. at the, the structural, the social, the political level, A. B, that does not permit the kind of moral, uh, the, uh, a psychoanalytic model, yeah. that once the trauma is told, yeah. the truth is out, the abreaction has happened, 
you then move on to a kind of level playing field. You put history behind you. This is precisely the problem that I'm arguing against. Right? Right. The, the move right. away from politics, away from trauma, mm -hmm. into a kind of Pax neoliberal, yeah? with an idea of equal recognition, yeah? each voice counting, right? uh, that level playing field that will be redeemed through a kind of idea of a kind of market-based democracy. It's precisely what we see in South Africa. The trauma is ongoing here. The trauma is an expression of a deep structural long durée right? that right. has had reaccommodations and resettlements but is constantly emerging out of the present conditions. If I can give you one small vignette that will explain this. At the time that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was making its peregrinations around the countryside, it came to the northwest where I was working in various capacities in the local community. At the same moment that we had this highly showcased televisual recounting of trauma in a very impersonal, I mean, one cannot resist this, and it's all about things that are horrifying and we have to witness them. Down the road, yeah. in a high school basketball field, yeah. unemployed young men were burning witches mm. in a form of an aggravation, cauterization, mm. effort to kind of exorcise the past mm. in a completely different way. And, and there was a kind of speaking to a history there in a, in a different kind of way. Yeah. Both of them expressed something yeah, that mm. needed to be connected. And the ongoing violence, the ongoing crime, the ongoing trauma that Towards South Africa in forms of violence that have a very particular kind of sociology to them, of psychology, um, to me belies the idea that one can simply rely on. Yes, trauma, of course, but the fetishism of trauma worries me tremendously. Right? It also implies a kind of a putting the past behind you, right? a sense that the post is significant enough, not only therapeutically, not only politically, but also in terms of a kind of politics and, 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 and analysis of history. And that's what problem. Mm -hmm. So, so Jean, I'm, I'm, please, Stephen, don't, uh, excuse me, I need to, to address this to Jean right now. Right. So I agree 300%, 300% with absolutely everything you've said. But what I'm not sure of, given the amount of work <clears throat> that's been done on the TDRC, yeah. the amount of work Julie Taylor has done, eight various people have done on the individuation yeah. of all of these commissions, why you're putting your emphasis on something that, in some ways, we already very well know, that the TRCs have not only individuated, they've dehistoricized and depoliticized. Mm -hmm. So what I want to, to think about is not what they're remembering, exactly where I think you're going, but what, how we can identify what they've excited, not what they've forgotten. Mm -hmm. But what's been excised, and you're saying it's the structures of dominance. So Julie Taylor says, look, they have all these individual memory um, TRCs, and nobody can talk about actually the collective forms in which, in which things operated. So I've argued in some way that it's, it's more an aphasia. It's, it's not that anyone forgets. It's not that it's remembered. It's the ways in which there's a decalage between words and things. But what I'm wondering, and I wish I had paired you with um, Alia, uh, um, his work, because she's working on something that is so relevant to this, on Merleau-Ponty's notion mm -hmm. of a past that has never been present, yeah. as the possibility, is there a critical nostalgia? This is a question Svetlana Boim asks, um, and doesn't really ever answer and doesn't get to. Is there something there that is not about retrieval, but of some kind of reconstitution that's not Nostalgia in a, um, I'll, I'll go fast, nostalgia, and it, it, but it's what, what Alia's work has been precisely about, something possible that it's come up in terms of Palestine and, and Israel, that thinking of, of some critical space, and you seem to be getting to yes. that, that very different kind of critical space, but I'm not sure you need to spend as much time telling us mm -hmm. about the other part, I mean, maybe in an audience that doesn't read about the TRC, but it's, it's this, this other ex excision that creates dissensus, that and not consensus. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah. I, I won't say it, I'm yeah. sorry. It was just five yeah. different parts okay. of it. Look, I mean, what I'm getting at here is the effort ultimately, not of the TRC per se, but the degree to which it lent dignity to a certain notion of memory. And what worries me is this. It occurs everywhere in our work. 
we are all sloppy in the way that we use the term. We use the term collective memory to talk about consciousness. Yeah. We use the term memory for very complicated ways in which the past is resuscitated in a politics of the present that to a large degree is linked now with a kind of commodification of memory as a form of heritage. It's a cottage industry. It's, it's a cottage industry. industry. We know that. Yeah. And so, but, but, but the mobilization that goes into this, I mean, one of the long uh, consequences of all of this has been the kind of politics of culture that I mentioned yesterday in talking about Gayatri's paper. Uh, and, and that is that this has authorized certain forms yeah. of, of this, th th this kind of, of romantic return. Yeah. Right that have in fact mobilized a whole new form of politics, right? yeah. and a new form of history that goes along with it, which constantly reaches for a term. Now, I, I, I don't disagree with you. Look, I'm an anthropologist who's worked on bodily experience for a very long time. My feeling is one can work on the possibility, the opening up of that, that, that dialectical space. This is why my feeling was to keep open the, 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 the fluidness between what constitutes an archive something that's never raised. You could do a whole study of the, uh, the TRC in terms of unsettling the very idea of what was an archive. People walked into those hearings holding digits, a finger, right? A, a human finger, and said, I want to know what this, reconnect this finger with a history for me, right? Mm -hmm. So they're those questions. They're the questions of the possibility of thinking about the kind of subjective memory, <coughs> memory that Holbrooks and others are talking about, that Merleau-Ponty allows us to think about. The forms of nostalgia that Jacob Glamini is talking about too are not nostalgia in the trivial, you know, sort of uh, commercialized sense, right. in the sentimentalized sense. They efforts to retreat, but one has constantly to see that they themselves are subject to exactly the same kind of critiques that we have leveled against more hegemonic master narratives, and that it's opening up that fluid reciprocal destabilization that I'm exactly. talking about. That's the issue. Yeah. Right? So it provides one with something. What worries me is this. I see this as part of an imminent critique, yeah? a way of opening up a space of conflict that this very TRC has presented us in our discomfort with it. The problem is that there is a huge, in Southern African studies, the reach for Benjamin, you know, the flash of something from elsewhere that some are, or the body you like notion. These are revelations, right? And they allow us to transcend the social and its imminent contradictions. So the work seems to me to be more complicated than it that. Is. It's not about the flash of, 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 of a new time. Right? Mm -hmm. It's about the complex way in which these terms can destabilize each other. Mm -hmm. And what worries me is a lot of the discourse, the unfolding discourse about transitional justice, but also the human, right, see somehow that that form of memory can redeem a kind I of agree. humanity that gets beyond politics and history mm -hmm. to start again. And it resonates with a neoliberal kind of discourse. Mm -hmm which to me is very troubling. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, I um, actually, I was going to start with, uh, thank you, I was going to start with a question for student looks, but, uh, but this exchange now gives me a, a handle. And I'm wondering, um, of course, uh, about Nicole Rojo and, and the way in which Nicole Rojo has given us a way of thinking about uh, remembering or not remembering, right, through the, the oath not to hold a grudge. Oh, Which sorry, not to hold a grudge. Oh, yeah. Nicole Lavoie, right? Yes, it, yes, with, yes, right. Uh, 405, they say. Um, so there, what she actually shows is precisely what, what you were getting at, I think, um, if I understood you correctly. The fact that the, the, there are two uh, uh, very important political questions that are being brought up. One is the fleshing out, of course, of, of, uh, of trauma, but also. The, the way in which flesh itself gets um, um, it gets negotiated uh, within the scheme of the one who has won the war and the other one who has actually absolutely lost it, right? And and who has won and who has lost is not always extremely clear, as as as, as you're showing, right? Um, so I was just wondering if perhaps the war was n would not be a way of of, of Thinking through this, right? E entering this, I know Jay is uh, is, uh, <laughs> is shaking his head, but for different reasons, I think. In terms of grudge and flesh and so on, uh, one of the things that worries me is that these terms are, you know, these sorts of terms are not easily translated into <coughs> into analytical and historical categories, right? The point about the kind of forgiveness yeah. that was 
ruled in, in a highly kind of performative way. In, from, and this is what I meant about no knowledge without cruelty. The mm -hmm. cruelty of those books <coughs> seemed to me to be extraordinary. I, there was indeed forgiveness, and the, the, uh, but that does not translate to me into larger social historical realities. For instance, one of the things that is so difficult to explain in South Africa is that along with all the forgiving and forgetting, you know, and the sense that everybody's ha harm was the same. We, uh, the, the people who were in the liberation movements spoke out their kinds of, uh, their, 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 the, the sorts of things they did, the sorts of grudges, alongside those who were you know, perpetrating one of the most inhumane systems of inequality. But th fine, this is the way we equalize those kinds of debates. But what has gone on alongside this is an extraordinarily stifled civil war of forms of, of, of grudge expression, right? That's high forms of rape and attack. Right? But I mean, they hide everywhere. But in South Africa, as, as our colleagues, Rose Morris and us, uh, others have pointed out, they have a complex semiotics right? that is expressing an anger. Forms of crime that are about wounding rather than simply the appropriation of wealth. The, the, the degree to which the deflection of all of this has gone into a kind of criminal economy which really defies the whole question of how one thinks about politics, violence, and ethics, I would say. I mean, it's a very complicated issue. Yeah. And the centrality of crime, by the way, and the problems of disorder yeah, mm -hmm. uh, on the agenda in all of the societies in which we live, it seems to me very interesting that we now use the criminal as the kind of every man around which we try to understand not only the nature of our society, but the nature of ethics. But the point is that in South Africa, those forms of grudges, at one level, there's been a lot of ostensibly you know, speaking them out. At another level, they deflected into other forms mm -hmm. you know, of reciprocal wounding you know, that, that, that are extremely problematical. And this language has not made it easy to get to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's doing it? I do agree with all what you've said and well, all the problems that are left in South Africa and that you stressed. And, but I just want to make two brief remarks. The first one is that what is so important to my eyes uh, and what happened with uh, TRC is that for the real, really first time, amnesty and amnesty, you yeah. know, which are double, which is a yes, double. Was uh, absolutely, uh, yeah. uh, and it's different from the others' uh, commissions, yeah. uh, even in Morocco or in uh, everywhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a mm -hmm. big point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And second, um, I want to to stress the way how individual became public. You know, the individual uh, story mm -hmm. became public. Uh, that means politics, and um, I, I am. I will also I will always remember the way uh, the ladies, you know, the old black ladies uh, in uh, Johannesburg were saying, "Oh, it won't work. Oh, it's over. It w it will never work." Their w their wife and their children are not there to hear them. Mm -hmm. That was the point, mm -hmm. and uh, the publicity, the uh, uh, full glare of publicity, as as the Tutu said. This is very important, I think, and it uh, rejoins it joins what uh, Protagoras, what I should have said if I had <laughs> you know, your last yes <laughs> made my second part, uh, what Protagoras put at the uh, bottom of the uh, well at the uh, origin of um, democracy and politics. It's idols and decay. Mm -hmm. Idols is uh, the way you are conscious. Uh, you are conscious of the. Uh, of the other seeing you, watching at you. This is idols, <coughs> uh, and they w you can you can translate as pudor or you know shame or as you want, but it's the same than the Bible rule. Uh, and they saw they were there. Well, that's the conscience of the others' uh, view, and this was provided by TRC, which of course was not provided. Is the second virtue. It's Decay. That's ah, that's repartition. Repartition. The, the repartition is no more uh, something only uh, you know that you can say. It's uh, really something that uh, that you must realize in a social economical mm. project. And this, with the reparation, was not done enough. Mm. So I propose to to share the things like that. You know. I dose, it was okay, and if this is needed for politics, 
and to, to, to pass from individual to politics, but decay was not. Yeah, I mean, I, do, I, I fully agree with you, and in some senses, look, for many people, we, we lived life on the assumption that apartheid was going to end with a bloodbath. Yeah. Mm. It did, and that probably has much more to do with the triumph of neoliberal capitalism yeah. and the end of the Cold War. I mean, there's a long story there, mm. right? Mm. I, I don't want to belittle the movements that were, but you know, there's a place for agency, but there also is a structural dimension to all of this. Um, so, and, and in some ways, the whole thing was a miracle. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was also tragically inadequate. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And the degree to which forms of this kind of reconciliation, which are going on all over the place, uh, are about speaking, you know, discursive performances of sensitization, it's all very important. The intersubjective is very important. But these are places where the long durée of, of empire remain. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and the, the gestures, of, it's not even a matter of reparations. That's precisely the wrong way, mm -hmm. it seems to me, to think about Absolutely. it, because these yes. are not things that can be indemnified to. There's a question of the way you make a whole society, you reorganize a whole society in response to that history of inequality. Right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, liberation came in South Africa at the same time as liberalization. Yes. Yeah. And actually, the effort, yeah. like everywhere else, to mm -hmm. build you know, social democracy on the basis of global capital. That's so it. the problems that remain, you know, are that black people are poorer, the, the Gini coefficients are greater in South Africa than they ever were, and there's much more poverty and hunger. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's the other side of it. Yes. But it's not to diminish the fact that, the, and there have been legacies. The fascinating thing is that that process of truth telling, yeah, mm -hmm. which was issued by many people, many activists didn't go near the TLC. Right? We don't hear about them. Mm -hmm. right? These are the people who in fact didn't feel the struggle was over. Right? That was a much longer durée of history. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've often seen even children in school organizing themselves mm -hmm. in conflict around this question of speaking truth out. Right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense in which the mimetic forms, the abilities to talk and recognize. Yeah. Now, one can say these are rhetorical forms that, that in a sense have become a dog yeah. But they also do mean something. I, I accept that there were consequences for all of this. But what one is simply saying is that you know the, the, the forms, and, and this is replicated in many other ways in which what's called sensitization to the problems of poverty or conflict resolution or whatever, right, have, have, have in fact become the norm. And they're much more about, if you like, speaking and subject formation. Mm -hmm. They are about the much larger questions of the way in which you rethink you know, the policy, the politics, the economics, yes. the, you know, all of those things. Uh, we've come to the end, right on time. Uh, sure Thank you.